understanding as the blood of a lamb was provided for a man and now it was provided for a family or for an entire household. And that Passover celebration began on that night in, in Egypt for all of the Hebrews and it's a celebration, a Passover meal that they continue to celebrate to this very day. Honoring the night that they were set free from the land of their captivity from Egyptian bondage. But God provided a lamb, a Passover lamb. And the blood of spilled by that lamb would, would cover a home, a family. But how many know the effects of sin go well beyond uh, an individual and well beyond a family? And so we move on. Now we, the, the children of Israel have left Egypt and now they're in the wilderness and God under the leadership of Moses is going to establish what we know as the Levitical system of worship or, or the law of Moses and all of the sacrifices that were going to be involved in. And God ordains that uh, there is a high priestly order set up and, and in the process of dealing with this condition of sin, once a year there was going to be the high priest who would take the blood of a sacrificial lamb or a goat and he would he would uh, once a year present the, the blood of that sacrificial lamb in the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it on the, the mercy seat which was on the Ark of the Covenant which was that uh, symbolic place where God's very presence dwelt here on earth with man under that old Levitical system. And with the sacrificial lamb of this of this uh, animal that was shed to cover the sins of the people for for that year that now we have this redemptive story where there was a lamb provided for a nation we had a lamb for a man we had a lamb for a home and now God provided a lamb for a nation and every year on the day of atonement the blood of that lamb was sprinkled on the mercy seat and God accepted it as covering for sin for a year. It was a temporary, annual, repeatable measure to deal with the sin condition of, of God's people. But it still wasn't the fulfillment of God's total redemptive plan, was it? And so now we have in this progressive story of God's love and His grace and His ability to deal with the sin condition of mankind, we come now, hundreds of years later, to John's declaration with Jesus approaching him at the Jordan River. We've had a lamb for a man, we've had a lamb for a home, we've had a lamb for a nation, and now Jesus, the culmination and the, actual, the, the complete perfect fulfillment of God's redemptive story comes on the scene. And John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. No longer just for a man, or for a home, or limited to one nation, one people. Now God provided through Jesus Christ, His perfect Lamb. He provided sin eradication and sin cleansing for the entire world. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And so that is the story of redemption and the background of the Lamb. And, and Jesus Christ came to fulfill this beautiful redemptive story of a Lamb needing to be sacrificed to deal with sin. Under the Old Covenant, under the Old System, it was a Lamb that extended to a nation, but it was only temporary. It only covered sin, and it was only good enough for one year. Under the new and living way that Jesus came to establish, and with his own blood, Hebrews goes into some, some length in describing the ministry now of Jesus. If you read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, it really is, is a, an explanation and a fulfillment of what all that Old Testament sacrificial system was about, and how Jesus completely fulfilled it. Because the writer of the Hebrews says in the ninth chapter, and in the tenth, he refers to this very thing that Jesus as the Lamb of God, as the sacrifice for sin, uh, as the Old Testament high priest used to go to the, to the tabernacle and the temple and offer the blood of an animal to cover the sins of the people, no longer was that going to be necessary because Jesus, as this Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, Himself went into the heavenly tabernacle and offered His own blood once and for all so that everyone's sin could be dealt with. Everyone's not only could 
could be covered over. It could be cleansed. It could be removed. It could be washed clean. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so that's what Jesus Christ did as the Lamb of God. Once and for all. For all of us. So no longer do we have the sacrifice of animals. Sheep and ram and goat. And it's, it's been done. It's been paid for. Jesus paid it all. Amen. So we have the background of the Lamb and Jesus coming as the Lamb of God. And so now we have the story of Bethlehem, the birth of the Lamb. We'll hear more of this in the next couple of weeks. And I, I know Pastor Larry will be, will be speaking on it specifically. But turn to Luke's Gospel for me as we take a look at the birth of the Lamb. Because if there's going to be the death of the Lamb, he needs to be born first. Of course, this is what we celebrate. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 26, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel came to, was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel said, answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Amen. Mary believed that as you read on in chapter 1. She received that word, accepted it in faith. Said, I, I, I will read. I, let it be according to your word. She gives a great uh, song of praise. And then we fast forward nine months. And chapter 2 of Luke, the first few verses say this. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed. The census was first taken place while Carmenius was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room. For them in the end. And so we have the beautiful story of the birth of the Lamb. I love this story. We'll read about it more over the next couple of weeks as we approach uh, Christmas. But the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, invaded human history in the most inconspicuous, uh, what seemed to be in the natural setting, absolute opposite way that the Savior of the world should come to the planet. Born to a virgin named Mary in what we know to be absolutely divine uh, in, in his origin. God used the gateway of a woman's womb to birth the Lamb. His only begotten Son. The Son of God, the seed of David, Jesus. Of course, there's much to go into the Christmas story, and today I don't have time to go into it. But we see that Jesus, the Lamb of God, declared to be, even before the foundation of the world began, and the redemptive story uh, of the Lamb unfolded in the Old Covenant, now is being fulfilled before our eyes as we read these scriptures. Behold the Lamb of God. So the story of Bethlehem is the story of the birth 
of the Lamb. We'll get into that uh, in more detail over the next couple of weeks. But the story of the background of the Lamb and the birth of the Lamb culminates for us and we celebrate it even today with communion again. With the death of the Lamb, the story of our salvation. And so we, uh, I've referenced Hebrew already and we're going to turn to John's Gospel again and we're going to uh, read what was read earlier from John. But the birth of the Lamb the, as someone said, the shadow of the cross reached back all the way to Bethlehem and the manger. Jesus was born to die. The Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, born that glorious night, angels declared it, shepherds spread it, wise men came and worshipped that beautiful baby boy, later declared the Lamb of God was born to die. He was born to take away our sin. So as we heard read this morning, his birth was for our death. Sorry, his birth was for his death, and his death is for our birth. And so we read in John's Gospel one of the most popular passages of Scripture, John chapter, chapter 3, this man named Nicodemus, a religious leader, one of the, the Pharisees, one of the, as we understand, one of the Sanhedrin Council, the religious leading group in all of the nation, came to Jesus secretly at night. He was uh, starting to believe in this guy when the popular opinion of the other religious leaders was uh, they didn't like this Jesus guy. And, uh, but he comes to Jesus at night and he says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, you come from God, no one can do the things that you do unless God is with you. And then Jesus responds to him as he's, he's trying, I think he's trying to butter up Jesus, you know, I'm trying to get a little close, he wants to, but Jesus gets right to the heart of the issue. He, he gets through all the religiosity and, uh, and all of the stuff that Nicodemus was maybe going to try to skirt around, he just goes, hey, you want to talk to me? You want to talk to me about what it really is going to take? Jesus says to him, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how, how can one be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Jesus said, Most assuredly, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. You must be born again. How many want to go to heaven? Yes. How many want to be a part of God's kingdom? I got really good news for you. You don't have to try to earn it. You don't have to try to deserve it. You don't have to try to uh, do a whole litany list of do's and don'ts. You don't have to you know, wear robes and, 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 and all you got to do is be born again. Amen. Right? Amen. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said you got to be born of the Spirit. Of the water and the Spirit. I, I was considering that phraseology. Some scholars suggest that the water is a reference to natural birth. Uh, it's of course, we know through the natural birth process, there's the breaking of the water, uh, and uh, then the, the child comes forth. Some reference that, that all those are going to be a part of the kingdom. You've got to be human. You've got to be naturally born first, right? That qualifies you to be prepared for kingdom. Uh, the kingdom is, is, is for those who are, are humans. You've got an earth suit on. You've been born on the planet. And when you're redeemed by the Spirit and born again by the Spirit, then that qualifies you to be a part of the heavenly kingdom. We're a part of the earthly kingdom, but we just don't want to stay a part of the earthly kingdom. We want to be a part of the heavenly kingdom. Amen. So it starts with born of water. Some suggest that as an interpretation. You've got to be human. 
and then born of the Spirit. Others suggest that born of water and the Spirit could refer to, and John the Baptist in, in this day and in this context was baptizing people in water. And that baptism was known as a, the baptism of repentance. They were repenting for their sins. And they were baptized by John, uh, a baptism unto repentance. And, and so Jesus may have been referring to, if you're going to be born again, you've got to be born of the water. You've got you to you have repentance in your heart. You've got to go through the waters of baptism. But, and, but he's got to be born of the Spirit as well. So there has to be the internal reality of God's Spirit coming in and taking that which is dead in sin and making it alive to God. And so there's this process of being born again. He said, don't be all a surprise that I tell you, you've got to be born again if you want to get to the kingdom. And so we've had this phraseology, of course, uh, since Jesus spoke it, and it's been... Uh, it's be, become popular in our North American modern day culture uh, to describe those who've experienced this as born again believers or born again Christians. And, uh, and Jesus came uh, as the Lamb of God to be born in a lowly manger to die so that we could be born. It's an interesting paradox, isn't it? This story of sacrifice and lamb and death and then birth and death for birth. But that's what it's all about. That's what this lamb candle is all about for us today. Jesus is that lamb. Not a lamb just for one or for a few or for a nation. Jesus is the lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. We're included in that today. And so that lamb was born in Bethlehem. That's the story of Bethlehem. Forever famous now because of the birth of that lamb. In a lonely manger 20 centuries ago. But his birth was for his death. And his death was for our birth. Amen. And so Jesus says, you must be born again. He said that to a very religious man. He said that to a man that, uh, in the eyes of the nation, was right with God. But he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus' words today, to us. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you if you're born again. Because you can't be. Not earned. Not paid for. Not deserved. Simply asked for and received by faith. Amen. For as we read on, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, should not die, but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. You can be saved today if you're not. You can be born again today if you're not. Right here, right now, in this birthing room, you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. That can happen just like that. In an instant of time. All because of the Lamb. <coughs> Born to take away our sin. Amen. Let's bow this close. Let's pray together. Father, I, I thank you that we can be reminded of the beautiful story of redemption that is the backdrop to Bethlehem. It's the background to the Christmas story. And yes, we do celebrate the beauty of, of this Christmas story, the, the glory of God becoming man, of heaven invading this planet Earth. Jesus being born as a babe in a manger. But we know the story didn't start there and it didn't end there. It started many, many centuries before with a lamb for a man. <coughs> and then a lamb for a home, and then a lamb for a nation. 
But Jesus, you are the only one in all of history that was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that's why you came. That's why you were born. You were born to die. In your death for our new birth. And so we just want to give you thanks and praise today on this beautiful December Sunday that we can acknowledge and worship you as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As the Savior of the world who came to die so that we could live. And so I pray today, Father, that we would all come to this, this absolute certainty in our hearts and our lives. We would know today that we are born again. That your death has brought us life. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Is there anyone here? I, before we conclude the service, I, I must give you opportunity. You may have been here a number of times. Maybe this is your first time. Maybe you've been here for years, but you're like Nicodemus. You've known what it is to, to walk and exist in religious circles. You've had the trappings of religion and you've had a head knowledge of God. But Jesus says, in order to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven, you have to be born of the spirit, not just of the flesh. You can't just work with religious and good activity. You have to be born again by the spirit of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, anyone in this room, although you may be churchy, and although you may be religious, you know right now, like Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You need to open up your heart and allow Christ by His Holy Spirit to come and make you alive on the inside and thus gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven instantaneously. Sins forgiven. That sacrifice of the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, it will be applied to your life. And your sin will not only be covered, it'll be cleansed, it'll be removed. It'll be gone. Is there anyone under the sound of my voice right now? You'll, you'll raise your hand and say, Pastor David, I want to be born again today, right now. I just want to give you opportunity. Yeah, amen. See, it's not about church attendance. It's not about knowing about God in your head. It's about believing and receiving God right down in your heart. Yeah, I see a couple of hands here. Amen. Lord God, we pray for these right now in Jesus' name. We pray the active work of Holy Spirit just to come and make the truth and the love of Jesus Christ Make it real to these hearts. Seal within them by your Holy Spirit and by faith that's activated in their lives right now. Seal within, within them this wonderful work of grace where they are born again in Jesus' name. Just pray this little prayer with me and you guys help. Jesus, Jesus. I believe that you're God's son. I believe that, you're God's son. that you died on the cross for me. Your death paid the sin penalty for my life. I believe you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I invite you to come into my heart. Be my Savior. Cleanse me from all of my sin. I confess I'm a sinner. And I receive your cleansing right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, can we give the Lord a hand? Hallelujah. Paul wrote this word. He said to uh, Titus, I believe it was, he said, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy he has saved us. Right. <laughs> by the washing of regeneration, or that redemptive process, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed abroad abundantly in our hearts through Jesus Christ. <laughs>
That's where we are today. Amen. Amen. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. God, we rejoice in this Christmas season that it's not just about Santa and reindeer. It's just not about presents. We know the reason for the season. We are your people celebrating the wonderful advent of your coming to earth. Your birth, which led to your death, which leads to our birth. Because we're born again. Spirit-filled, redeemed children of God. And so we thank you for this today. We rejoice in this today. We go rejoicing in your goodness. Celebrating and anticipating not only our celebrating now of Christmas, but your ultimate coming back to earth. And so we go with this joy. We go with this faith. We go with this hope in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Love one another. Greet one another again. We'll keep these altars open for a few minutes. Elders, stay close by if you want prayer.